Coming. My name is Tony Barbagallo. I'm VP of Product at uh, Coringo. And uh, before we get started, I just want to know how many object storage experts in the room? I know at least one of you isn't, because <laughs> you told me last <laughs> night. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's, <laughs> everyone's pointing your way. <laughs> isn't everyone? Okay, so, uh, so let's get started. Really quickly on the company, <clears throat> uh, as, as uh, Stephen mentioned, we've been around for a little over 10 years. Our founders actually created the original tech technology that was the basis for EMC Centera, so content addressable storage. Uh, that's why we actually have some compliance features as well in our platform. Uh, we hit our 100 customer mark back in 2010 and uh, we have hundreds of customers today and uh, going on our 11th year uh, in the business. Um, we've, uh, we've received a number of, of awards and recognition integration with many uh, organizations that you may have heard of and may have not. Uh, DDB is an interesting one. They're actually the online storage that you would get if you buy a Dell laptop uh, with that 30-day trial. They use Coringo uh, Swarm as the back end to manage all of, the, all of the data that they're stored for their customers. And then we, we have some very uh, large and small customers alike, um, Department of Justice, Department of Defense, uh, some one. medical co companies, et cetera. Very large and small. Um, so that was it for the company. So one of the things we've been following sort of uh, some of you guys' blogs and tweets, and I think one of the questions that I saw alluded to is, what is object storage good for? I can set this stuff up. It looks really interesting. But what is it actually good for? And I, I actually took this from uh, Enterprise Strategy Group's definition of object storage. And they basically say, manage and protect yes. data at massive scale. So massive sta scale could be multiple petabytes. Could be billions of objects that only take up terabytes of, of actual storage capacity. But it's about the management of that data and the protection of that data. In other words, no backup windows, et cetera. So what are the use cases? Um, On-premise cloud storage. And I think someone else had, had, in the room had, had uh, wondered why everyone wouldn't just store uh, data to the cloud in the first place. Um, there, get to be, there gets to be economic issues when you're talking about petabytes of storage, but also there's security issues. So again, some of our customers are uh, somewhat concerned about security. Uh, for instance, the uh, city of Austin, their in-vehicle in, uh, police uh, videos are all stored in Coringo Swarm. Used to be stored in NetApp, but they were hitting a, a wall as they were getting up to about two petabytes of storage, and we're looking for actually cloud-based storage that they could use on premise. So that's, that's the notion of that. We also are actually the back end storage for British Telecom and Telefonica. So that is cloud based storage. It just happens to be for them on premise storage that they are providing a service to their end users. Another one is the storage platform for data analytics. We have a number of customers that actually use us as the back end store for Hadoop. And the main reason for that, which I'll actually get to in the next slide, is around the ability to do erasure coding as opposed to straight replications, which Hadoop tends to do. So you're getting into some storage savings as you're storing more and more and more data. And, and lastly, it sort of brings it all home, and I talked about these already, but image storage, organization, search and retrieval, all HTTP based, no file systems to get in the way. So those are the, the kind of key, key use cases. There are others, but, uh, but those are the big ones. Um, <clears throat> so then I think uh, we were talking uh, last night um, to, to someone and they said, so you've got a bunch of features in the product. Where did you, how did you come up with those features? Some we created on our own from, from our technology and our, uh, our vision. Many others we got from working with customers like the ones I mentioned. And I figured I'd point out so four of, the, four of our uh, features that are unique to us and why they matter. First one is mix and match any x86 server and capacity. And that's the key, is the and capacity. Uh, typical implementations require like capacity on the server. So why is that interesting? Well, that's interesting because I can, for instance, swap out my older server that has two terabyte drives on it and swap in a new server with eight terabyte drives or six terabyte drives or just swap out the drives. We don't care. Russell is going to talk about our data market and how we do bidding so that we make sure everything is load balanced uh, appropriately across the disparate servers in terms of performance and capacity. So very key. The other thing is with these servers, we absorb them into the cluster. We were talking uh, 
uh, yesterday about migration and heavy forklift migrations when you have to add <coughs> new servers or perhaps change protection schemes. Uh, with Swarm, you simply add a server, that server is absorbed into the cluster. If you need to retire servers, the data is, <coughs> is uniformly migrated against the remaining servers in the cluster. So there is really no such thing for us as, as the word migration in our, in our environment. The next one is elastic content protection. This is again something that only we do. And that is the ability to, in an object by object basis, I can define whether I want that object replicated for data protection or erasure coded with any erasure coding scheme I want. 5.2, 10.2, 4.3, pick a scheme. For object by object basis, we support that. So again, typically that's, a, that's an incredible a migration and transition if you want to move from say replication to erasure coding for the data in your cluster. In fact, we have a, a company in Europe that does uh, streaming, streaming video and they start a video with 100 reps so that they can get quick access as a new release, so more people want to look at a new release than the older movies. And then using uh, life points, which is the next feature we have here, after 90 days, they move that from 100 reps down to a 10.2 replication scheme. And they're basically what they've done is they've, they've now saved that much storage as they go forward because while they need the content still to be available, it doesn't need to be as highly available as it was in the first 90 days of a movie's release. Life points are also used to do just that. Determine ahead of time, if you will, the life cycle of a particular object. Uh, Lytle is a European retailer, and uh, what they use life points for is for their seasonal images that they store online, they want to just have those automatically deleted, deleted after a sale's over or after the Christmas season is over, et cetera. And then last but not least, and I won't go into this in large detail because this will be covered in additional sections, but we encapsulate the metadata for each object with the data itself. Typically, uh, object storage implementa implementations use a relational uh, database to store all the metadata and indexing about all of the objects in their system. We've encapsulated that with the data. We then do cache that information so that it's quickly retrievable from an indexing standpoint. But what that does is you don't really need any DBAs to manage your, your system, to manage Swarm, uh, because there are no relational databases in the system. So those are just, those are four of the ones that I chose to pick out. And we'll, we'll get into a, a more of those details as we go forward. And then lastly, this is just a quick architectural view of the system. So on the top, you would have your HTTP-based or file system-based applications. Uh, we support a number of different protocols that are interoperable. We'll talk about those. But HTTP, uh, we have our own uh, protocol, which extends the HTTP <coughs> protocol. Amazon S3, which we're compatible with. We have a plugin uh, that would replace OpenStack Swift in an OpenStack environment. We have a connector that replaces HDFS for uh, Hadoop. And then we also have uh, a fully automated application that runs on Windows that will automate and will, that will seamlessly migrate uh, files from NetApp or Windows into Keringo Swarm and then back again if the user accesses them. So you can think of that as thin <coughs> provisioning for your NetApp or Windows, Windows file servers. Um, in the middle here, we have a notion of multi-tenancy and an orchestration layer. So again, we have a number of MSPs that use our product. They need to have uh, multi-tenancy for their customers and their customer storage to uh, isolate the storage. Bottom here, we have our, our object storage cluster, which is, uh, which is the section that we'll, we'll move into next. And then, again, very unique, we have integrated search. So we have a, if you will, a NoSQL-like database ad hoc search and query capability. And we think this is something that is going to be uh, really futuristic and, and what people will start to use as they want to do more analysis on their data as you get more and more data. So and then on the, so on the far me. side, sorry. The search is through for the metadata associated with an object or you actually crack open the object to understand the... Yeah, the, the former. It's for the metadata associated with an object. And then lastly, we have a portal for viewing all of this. So that's, that's essentially the architecture, and uh, that's, that's my 10 minutes, and I'm the one who's keeping track of when people are done with their time. So I'm giving myself the hook right now, unless there are any questions.
Okay, thank you.